Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Noel McCarty. I'm the acting dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to our uh, afternoon roundtable discussion on Rightward Bound, Making America Conservative in the 1970s and What It Means in 2008. Um, I'm not just delighted to uh, moderate and host this event because it's being held in the school that I administer, but also it's a topic uh, that I myself have thought a lot about. Uh, a couple of years ago, before uh, enmeshing myself in administrative work, I myself uh, wrote a book trying to explain uh, the rise of conservatism in polarized politics in the United States. And the 1970s were indeed a pivotal part of my story, uh, focusing on uh, economic uh, changes uh, in terms of international, international trade and the decline of the uh, uh, economic policy consensus of World War II, following World War II. Uh, but one of the things I discovered in writing the book was that while my focus was on economic changes, so many other things changed in American society in the 1970s, uh, cultural, social, institutional, that it really became clear that the 1970s were a real pivot point uh, in American uh, political history, and not just for uh, the rise of political polarization uh, and conservatism. But now we have a, ter a terrific edited volume, uh, uh, edited by our own Julian Zelitzer uh, and uh, 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 Bruce Schulman, uh, that will sort of uh, tease out many of these uh, changes and trends uh, in American uh uh, culture and society and their relationship uh, to uh, political conservatism. Uh, and so I think this is an exciting new book, and so I'm very delighted to, to host this roundtable uh, discussion. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to get it started. I'll, I'll start out by introducing our, uh, uh, our panelists, uh, perhaps consistent with the theme of today's panel. I'll start from left. I'll move from left to right. Uh, I'm not sure that reflects anything other than uh, the seating order in uh, geography. But let me start uh, and introduce uh, Bruce Schulman. Uh, he is the author of several books, including uh, the book we're here to talk about today, Rightward Bound, which he co-edited with Julian Zeltzer. Uh, he's previously served as the director of the History Project in California, a joint effort of the California and California State Department of Education to improve history education in the public schools. As an associate professor at UCLA, Shulman received the Luckman Distinguished Teaching Award and the Ebby Award for the Art of Teaching. He has also served as the director of the American and New England Studies Program at Boston University, where he's currently a professor of history. Uh, moving, uh, moving farther right, uh, I'd like to introduce Bill Berkowitz, who has been tracking and monitoring conservative political and social movements in the United States for the past 25 years. In 1977, he helped to found the Data Center, a research library and information center for social activists and investigative journalists, and became the founding editor of the Center's Culture Watch newsletter, one of the first national publications systematically tracking the conservative movement from the 1990s through the 2000 presidential election. In 2005, he was given the Journalism Award by the Before Columbus Foundation. Next uh, is our own Paul Starr, who is Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs here at Princeton and the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, where he's also the Stewart Professor of Communications. He is the co-editor with Robert Kuttner and co-founder with Robert Kuttner and Robert Reich of the American Prospect, a notable liberal magazine which was created in 1990. In 1993, Starr served as Senior Advisor for President Bill Clinton's proposed health care reform plan. He received the 1984 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction and the Bancroft Prize in American History for the Social Transformation of American Medicine and the 2000 Goldsmith Booker Prize, Book Prize for the Creation of the Media. His most recent book is Freedom's Power, a History on the Promise of Liberalism, and it will be out in paperback this spring. Finally, we'll conclude with Julian Zeltzer, uh, a new uh, recruit to the Woodrow Wilson School that I'm very delighted uh, to, to have here. Uh, his research includes uh, work on the United States Congress, the 20th century presidency, and democracy. 
He's the author of seven books. His most recent is titled Rightward Bound, The Making of the Conservative Movement in the 1970s, the one we're here to talk about. Uh, and he's currently working on a, uh, what I think will be a very important book on the development of conservative uh, international, uh, conservative ideology related to international affairs. Uh, and as I mentioned, he has uh, recently joined us as professor of history and public affairs at the, at the Woodrow Wilson School. So with that, let me, uh, let me uh, turn it over uh, to Bruce uh, to start the discussion. Oh, okay. Uh, I apologize. My apologies. Julian will actually <laughs> Julian will actually begin. Nothing to do with political preferences. Uh, Today is a puzzling time in American politics. In many ways, conservatism dominates the political landscape. Conservative institutions uh, crisscross uh, all over America. Unilateralism and militarism seem to rule in American foreign policy. In domestic affairs, we have seen how Americans in Washington seem to resist robust controls on energy consumption or greenhouse gas emissions. The nation has battled over stem cell research and creationism in the public schools every few years, and Republicans and Democrats have scrambled to cut taxes. Conservative President Ronald Reagan has become the iconic figure for the current generation of voters uh, the liberal godfather Franklin Roosevelt had been uh, to many Americans in the 40s, 50s, and 1960s. Yet conservative vulnerabilities sometimes appear as prominent as their strength, and not just because of the particular problems that the current Bush administration faces. The reality of conservative America is that the federal government remains quite large, larger than when the Bush administration started. When disasters strike, we turn to government. When we retire, we turn to government. When we face external threats, we turn to government. Republicans fail to curb the growth of the federal government between 2001 and today, even when they controlled both the White House and Congress. In fact, the Republican leadership has initiated new forms of government, ranging from no child left behind to a massive domestic surveillance program to prescription drugs for the Medicare program. Notwithstanding the hawkish rhetoric flowing out of Washington, Americans have not flocked to volunteer for the war in Iraq. Public opinion of the president's military programs has remained very low. With all the talk about the power of the religious right, popular culture is replete with brash sexuality and cons that the conservative movement has often decried. This racy material is not just popular in the so-called red states of America, but in the coastal, uh, in, 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 in the blue states and red states, uh, we see similar types of shows. Americans, I said in an interview, uh, might enjoy watching reruns of Leave it to Beaver, but they don't want to live that way. Voters continue uh, uh, to oppose efforts to cut programs such as Social Security. Bruce and I concluded that we could only understand the current situation uh, by looking at the origins of the conservative movement and what we've called the incomplete revolution that took place in the 1970s. The 70s unlocked the mysteries of today because that decade constituted a critical turning point in American history and established the foundations of current debate. The policies, the social movements, the leaders, and the institutional changes that emerged from that decade continue to influence this country. Until recently, historians generally ignored the 60s as a pivotal period, even if the era's most potent political legacy has been conservative. After recounting bad hairstyles and bizarre clothing choices from that era, although usually praising great movies, most textbooks jump right to the 1980s. They seek to capture how Ronald Reagan transformed America, downplaying the decade that preceded it and the role of what happened in those years. Now, uh, many, uh, several decades after the fact, historians are starting to look again and see that the 1970s were quite important. The 70s, the authors in our book uh, argue, transformed American economic, cultural, and political life. Uh, in many ways, as much as uh, the changes that happened after the 1930s and 1960s. In race relations, religion, family life, economics, politics, and popular culture, we argue that the 1970s was a watershed. 
Our interest in the decade was intellectual and also political. Uh, intellectual in that over the past few years, we have seen a new generation of historians who are not rooted in the battles of the 1960s and the memories of the 1960s, who have been able to look with fresh eyes at the importance of the 1970s. And they're starting to converge on a common set of themes, looking at the organizational triumphs of conservatism in this decade. They've been looking at the regional shift that takes place, for example, in American politics as national power shifts to the South and the West, drawing strength from the burgeoning population uh, in, in those regions of the country. We have seen how the South and Southwest start to wrestle control away from the Northeast during the 70s. Since the mid-60s, Sunbelt conservative candidates have won uh, our presidential elections. We have seen presidents in the White House from Georgia, Cal California, Texas, and Arkansas. The South's historic policy prescriptions, low taxes, scant public services, deferences to religious sensibilities, military preparedness have all become the ways and means of Washington, D.C. But we also have found and argue in this book that the shift to the right was not inevitable, uh, much less so than previous accounts have suggested. The authors in this book conclude that the embrace of conservatism was fiercely contested. It involved hard-fought battles and crucial compromises in which the accomplishments of 20th century liberalism remained very strong. At the heart of the 70s, we find in this book, was a massive mobilization by activists, organizations, and political elites associated with a conservative movement. They built an organizational infrastructure of political action committees, volunteer uh, operations, radio talk shows, think tanks, direct mail networks, and more. And this was how the agenda moved so dramatically. But the movement does not run roughshod over what had been built over the rest of the century. And that is what a lot of the essays are about. Conservatism was layered over the accumulated changes uh, of the rest of the century. Liberalism remained embedded in national politics. Popular culture ret retained the impulses of the 1960s. And social movements opposing conservative values also flourished. The triumphs of the right at the ballot box and broadly across American society would take place against the backdrop where the accomplishments of liberalism still mattered. The contributors of our book crystallize this new portrait of the decade. They look at three issues, domestic government, international relations, and political culture to better understand the growth of the conservative movement, but this tension between conservatism and liberalism. The first part of the book looks at the development of a conservative movement, trying to understand how so many Americans came to perceive themselves as sympathetic to these issues. We find that the shift in political identity did not flow naturally out of long-term demographic or political change, but was the product of political organization and activism. Matt Lasseter looks at how conservative activists seize political advantage by emphasizing the cultural factors behind economic decline rather than the economic issues. Um, Paul Boyer traces a vast and energetic network of religious, evangelical religious leaders who built the movement from the bottom up. Alice O'Connor in her book looks at how conservative foundations provided the political capital to neoconservative policymakers and movement activists uh, that allowed them to spread the ideas of the right. The second part of the book turns to policy and politics, looking at places where the conservative movement scored some important victories. John Scrutiny and Thomas Segru show how a small circle of advisors working in Richard Nixon's administration capitalized on the ethnic revival of the 1970s and harnessed it to conservative electoral objectives. In the realm of the energy crisis, Meg Jacobs explains how conservative elites institutionalized themselves in the executive branch so they could promote a vision of energy policy that centered on deregulation. Jeremy Surrey looks at how Ronald Reagan was able in the 70s to break into the foreign policy community and start to shift the debate away from detente. I have a chapter at the end 
looking at how politicians uh, affiliated with the conservative movement were able to defeat President Jimmy Carter on a series of battles and redefine national security to debate. Together, the contributors make clear that the 1970s witnessed transformations that established the tenor of contemporary American politics. The decade was not a pause between two great periods, but itself marked an era that witnessed the emergence of trends, contests, and conflicts that have defined public life ever since. The incomplete revolution of the 70s defines our America. The incomplete revolution that conservatives directed in the 70s makes the problems they face today, we would say, particularly challenging. Conservatives won't be transformed by a new president because the challenges are rooted in the founding. They're rooted in this 1970s decade. America did turn right in the 70s, but not as a result of a political sweep. As the conservative movement took shape and expanded its influence, it faced challenges, it faced a struggle with liberalism and liberal social values. And those struggles linger today and help explain a lot of what American politics is all about. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted uh, to be here to uh, discuss and to um, celebrate uh, this uh, new collection uh, that uh, Julian and uh, Bruce have uh, edited. Um, it uh, helps to uh, illuminate the historical and political questions uh, surrounding uh, the 1970s. And I completely agree with them uh, that uh, the 1970s were uh, a crucial moment of change uh, in, uh, uh, in our history uh, that uh, really do set the basis for understanding uh, many of the uh, conflicts uh, that, we, uh, that we face uh, t today. Um, it's uh, a period, of course, not only when uh, conservatism uh, gained momentum, uh, it's a time when liberalism lost momentum, and that is something which, of, which is very much uh, of concern to me. But I, I take it we're not here to debate the substance of the politics, but the historical question of what happened uh, in the 1970s uh, and why America uh, moved uh, in uh, a conservative direction uh, 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 thereafter. And uh, my perspective on the 70s, I think, is a little bit different uh, from that of this book. And uh, I want to present it uh, kind of as uh, having three aspects to it. Um, first of all, I think to understand what happened in the United States, we need to see it in an international perspective. Uh, that there was a global economic crisis during the 1970s uh, that had unsettling political effects uh, in many, many different parts of the world. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we need to view the 1970s in a social context. I'm a historical sociologist. Uh, and uh, there is uh, there a, a whole series of underlying economic <coughs> and social trends uh, that uh, dramatically shifted uh, during uh, the 1970s. And then third, uh, I think we need to look at the, at the contingent political circumstances uh, in the United States. Uh, the peculiar relationship uh, between the 1960s and the 70s. Uh, it, the, the, the economic and social shifts that happened in the 70s coincided with a backlash against changes, particularly in racial and gender relations, that had begun uh, in the 1960s. But uh, actually, there were a series of historical uh, developments, historical events, uh, the most important of which was Watergate, that actually slowed up the expression of those tendencies, that actually slowed up conservatism, that allowed Democrats to win the presidency in 1976 and to control Congress. Uh, throughout the decade. So things actually didn't move uh, in as much of a conservative direction as you might have expected on the basis of those underlying trends. So first, the international uh, context. Uh, all that came to a head uh, with the uh, Arab oil embargo, 1974-75, and the resulting uh, economic uh, disruptions, uh, the widespread stagflation uh, during uh, the 1970s, uh, that uh, uh, was uh, an enormously uh, uh, disruptive uh, shift. Um, uh, but the crisis didn't merely come from uh, the rising 
uh, price of oil and, uh, and other uh, natural resources. Uh, there were uh, underlying uh, factors uh, that uh, uh, arose from really fundamental changes uh, in uh, social and economic organization uh, that had to do, for example, with the new wave of technological uh, innovation associated with uh, electronics and computers uh, that was uh, reshaping uh, the advanced uh, economies. Uh, I think back to the whole series of books uh, that were written uh, beginning um, uh, as I recall, with Daniel Bell's uh, The Coming of Post-Industrial Society in 1973, including uh, various other books such as uh, 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 Charles uh, Sables and Michael Puri's uh, The Second Industrial Divide, uh, Ben Harrison and Barry Bluestone's The, the Great U-Turn. These were all books of the period that recognized uh, the fundamental changes that were taking place. The shift, as Bell put it, uh, from uh, a system that emphasized production of goods to production of services that increasingly emphasized the importance of uh, information and knowledge as the central engines of economic growth. Uh, the shift, as others put it, from a mass production orientation to for flexible manufacturing, mass customization. Uh, the shift, or another way of putting it, from high volume to high volume value uh, production. Uh, the results were... Uh, on the one hand, the emergence of new industries, uh, uh, like the computer industry, but on the other hand, really devastating effects on a whole series of older industries, steel, coal, shipbuilding, and so forth, uh, which uh, were increasingly uh, no longer competitive uh, uh, in, in uh, the United States and much of Europe and so forth. Uh, so there was a, a general crisis uh, that uh, uh, extended uh, across uh, uh, the world. I was uh, very struck, uh, for example, in uh, Stephen Kotkin's uh, excellent book, Armageddon Averted, about uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, that uh, he, he argues that it was, it was during the 70s that the crisis really appeared in the Soviet Union. Economic growth rates actually had been pretty strong earlier uh, in its history, but growth slowed down. All of the underlying inefficiencies of the Soviet economy uh, really uh, became uh, apparent. And the Soviet Union was never able to uh, recover. Was ne ne it never made any contribution to the emerging electronics, computer industries. It completely was unable to adapt to the new era uh, that, was, uh, that was emerging. Uh, Western Europe also went through a crisis in the 1970s. Uh, in England, under uh, the labor government, Callahan's labor government, uh, the strikes, coal industry and elsewhere, the crisis with uh, various uh, uh, nationalized uh, industries, uh, uh, eventually the uh, election of Margaret Thatcher and the conservatives, and uh, London at that point became the center in thinking about privatization, liberalization, uh, uh, not just uh, for Britain, but uh, in much of the rest of the world. Uh, but... Um, uh, it's not as though all the movements were in a conservative direction. In France, socialists under Mitterrand got elected. But uh, that response uh, did, not prove, uh, did not prove successful. Other moves toward corporatism in Europe also uh, uh, failed. But what did succeed in Europe in the long run was uh, the move toward the creation of a wider market uh, uh, from what was originally the common market uh, through now what uh, is uh, the European Union. And, uh, and as difficult as the transition has been, Europe, Europe was able to make uh, uh, the change. And uh, uh, that meant discarding uh, a lot of the socialist policies that had earlier uh, uh, dominated uh, uh, in Europe, and, uh, uh, but without uh, completely uh, discarding by any means uh, the welfare state uh, institutions uh, that had developed uh, over, over a very long period of time. So uh, the United States was not the only what I'm trying to emphasize, the United States was not the only part of the world that was undergoing uh, a, uh, an economic and a political crisis. Uh, it's really striking if you look at uh, a whole variety of uh, economic and social trends, how critical the 1970s were in terms of growth rates, in terms of productivity growth, uh, in terms of demographic changes. This is the period when uh, the baby boom is hitting the labor market. A tremendous expansion in the numbers of young workers, in the, in the numbers of women workers. Uh, so the composition of the labor force uh, well, was shifting uh, quite dramatically. Uh, this is the period when, uh, after three decades, when there was no change in the United States in the distribution of income, 
It had been basically flat since uh, the 1940s. There, we, we had gone through something that uh, uh, an economist called the Great Compression. After the high levels of inequality in the 1920s, during the 30s and 40s, inequality was reduced. Incomes were much more equal up until the mid-70s. Since then, income and wealth have become much more unequally distributed in the United States. The 70s are the moment when that uh, changes. Or take another series of trends. Uh, the levels of, of uh, civic participation uh, that uh, Robert Putnam has described in uh, his work in uh, the book Bowling Alone, it's again, it's in the 70s that we begin to see the shift from higher levels of participation, voter turnout, uh, participation in community meetings and various other things, all these things start going down uh, in uh, the mid-70s. The 70s are also a period when uh, uh, we see the shift in American policy toward incarceration, tremendous increase in rates of incarceration, again, beginning uh, right in the same period. All of these things take off at the same time. Uh, it is absolutely striking. So these are fundamental changes. Uh, that were taking place uh, in our society. And I think they involve both the, uh, uh, the effects of uh, uh, these fundamental changes in, uh, in, in economic life and the way America responded politically uh, to, those, uh, to those changes. Uh, so with the high inflation, uh, there were a, a whole series of tax revolts at the state level, Proposition 13 in, in California and various other states. Uh, people were facing rising prices. What was one price that they could control? Taxes. And uh, the response that, uh, uh, of, uh, of voters, I think, was very understandable in that, uh, in that context. But as I said at the beginning, actually, things didn't move in quite as much of a conservative direction as one might have expected. And I think that was partly because of the uh, uh, Watergate, which is an event that kind of stands outside of all those trends. Simply, you know, one of those uh, extraordinary political moments in history, uh, which uh, produces uh, uh, specific effects. There was a huge uh, influx of Democrats into the Congress in 1974. A freshman class of, I think, it was over 70 who got elected. Uh, I think uh, Carter's election in 1976. Remember, he promised he wouldn't lie to us. That was also, uh, uh, to some extent, a response uh, to uh, to Watergate. And so, uh, in a way, I think the conservative movement was uh, was kind of held up. But you had these underlying trends. You had the fundamental shift that was going on of the South. I mean, once once the Democratic Party had uh, uh, moved over, supported civil rights, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, uh, recognized that when he signed the Civil Rights Act, there goes the South, uh, and it took uh, it took uh, decades to be fully worked out. But there was no doubt that whatever the particular candidates were over the long run, uh, there was going to be that uh, there was going to be that uh, turnaround. The Democratic Party lost a lot of its own traditional base, not just in the South, but white working class voters uh, in uh, in other <coughs> regions uh, as well. Um, one of the things I think that uh, probably can be held against the liberalism of the 1960s is that it didn't anticipate what was going to happen in the 1970s. Uh, uh, we had no idea uh, that there were going to be these fundamental changes. And many of the policies, many of the ideas were conceived really for a different uh, 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 set of realities. And uh, there needed to be a change uh, among liberals. It took a long time, I think, to work out some of those changes. Uh, there have been a whole series of efforts to recast liberalism. I think, I think Bill Clinton's was actually a very significant part of that. And, uh, and uh, the transition, uh, uh, I believe, has, uh, has taken place. And uh, although in the 70s, I don't think liberals had adequately reacted, could have really fully grasped uh, the significance of what was happen happening, I think by now uh, uh, we have. I, I count myself as liberal, and uh, and the, the the nature of the contest between liberalism and conservatism has accordingly changed. I want to uh, start off by thanking Dale Satin for bringing me here today, and uh, my wife for accompanying me from Oakland, and my daughter who has taken time off from her busy caseload as a social worker in Springfield, Massachusetts for also coming here today. A few years back, I'm going to start with a little parenthesis. A few years back, Thomas Frank penned the best-selling book, What's the Matter with Kansas? And the book described how a, how a politically agitated and savvy group 
of religious leaders guided an already conservative electorate towards from voting from their pocketbooks for so-called traditional social values. Today, and at least for a few shining moments, I'm here to tell you that there's nothing the matter with Kansas. <laughs> so, with a tip of the cap to the great Bill Bradley and the legendary Pete Carrill, here's one rock chalk Jayhawk KU from a proud Kansas University alumnus in honor of Monday night's victory in the NCAA basketball. <laughs> I'm going to uh, move towards and discuss uh, the religious right and the ramifications in this period uh, of, of what's happening with the religious right. Even this morning, I read a piece by a woman uh, called, uh, named Janet Folger, who's the head of an organization called Faith to Action. She's the woman who brought together all the, the Republican Party candidates for a debate in September about uh, traditional value issues. And she was lambasting uh, other religious right leaders for their support of Fred Thompson, Rudy Giuliani, and Mitt Romney. She said there was a lack of trustworthy leadership on the right and the pro-family movement. Uh, if you want to call yourself a leader, you have to lead. If you're going to be pro-family, then we need to lead in the pro-family direction. Very strident, very sharp, and very indicative of what is going on within the movement. These days, you can uh, hardly stumble out of your doorway pick up your daily newspaper, open a news magazine, or log on to the internet without encountering news of a meeting, conference, book signing party, or a spate of articles with the theme, Wither the Religious Right? Or, more bluntly, Is the Religious Right Dead? While this, give, while this gives juice to political junkies, we'll know that the question has reached the country's kitchen tables when a copy of Real Simple or Sports Illustrated arrives in your mailbox with cover stories headline, From Jimmy Swaggart to Ted Haggard, 25 years, 25 ways to clean up a really big mess. Or, has the religious right been doing steroids for the past two decades? Until that happens, the debate over the religious right status often remains inside baseball. Since the advent of the modern religious right in the 1970s, some analysts have consistently seen the slightest misstep, defeat, scandal, as portents of the movement's decline. Others have chatted on about an unstoppable juggernaut, exemplified by the presidential administration stocked with graduates of the religious rights culture war classrooms and GOP-linked values voters flocking to the polls in record numbers. As we face another critical presidential election, we are not so much witnessing the end times of a so-called juggernaut. Rather, we are watching a movement in transition a movement scrambling for a new identity, a movement attempting to recalibrate to deal with a set of decidedly different political circumstances. However, despite all this activity, the religious right remains a powerful, if somewhat fractured, political movement. A few weeks back, Focus on the Family's founder, Dr. James Dobson, spoke about the movement's future. During an appearance at the National Religious Broadcasters Conference, Dobson, who oversees a multi-million dollar media empire, expressed deep concern about the movement he has helped build and define. The question is, Dobson said, will the younger generation heed the call? Who will defend the unborn child in the years to come? Who will plead for the Terry Chavos of the world? Who's going to fight for the institution of marriage, which is on the ropes today? Dobson pointed out in a rather macabre way that the deaths of the Reverend Jerry Falwell, Dr. D. James Kennedy, and Ruth Graham Bell signaled the end of an era. And he noted that others like Billy Graham, Chuck Colson, Pat Robertson, and Chuck Swindell will soon follow that same path. Who in the next generation will be willing to take the heat when it's much safer and more comfortable to avoid controversial subjects, Dobson asked. What will be the impact on the conservative Christian church when the patriarchs have passed? And Dobson is a fellow who has already declared that he would not support John McCain under any circumstances, has been flirting with a third-party candidacy, and has uh, pretty much stepped back from the fray uh, in recent days. In New York City, in mid-March, The Nation magazine, Left Forum 2008, featured a panel titled, Is the Christian Right Dead? Promotional materials for the panel read, the coalition between economic and social conservatives seemed kind of rocky coming out of the Bush presidency that brought them together. 
Is the Christian right dead? The religious right, one wing, albeit the most colorful and grassroots oriented, of what in the early 1980s was termed the new right. From its inception, the new right was a self-conscious movement, founded on a set of principles, benchmarks, and talking points. All of them were adjustable when necessary to suit the political times. It was driven by highly motivated, politically savvy conservative activists, many of whom had been involved with the failed 1964 presidential campaign of Senator Barry Goldwater. It also included a core group of willing and equally motivated conservative entrepreneurs and philanthropists. The nascent movement forged a working coalition of free market advocates, religious conservatives, cold warriors, libertarians, paleoconservatives, and later neoconservatives. They didn't always agree on everything. They didn't have to. They needed, however, to agree to disagrees to disagree in ways that wouldn't tear the coalition apart. Interestingly enough, many conservative leaders who excoriated the liberal establishment acknowledged that they learned a great deal by attending civil rights meetings, meetings of civil rights organizations in Washington during the 1970s. The modern religious right is generally traced to the founding of Reverend Jerry Falwell's moral majority in the late 1970s. Paul Weyrich, who is now considered the godfather of the new right, was one of those who handpicked the Reverend Falwell to head up the organization. The movement grew itself in the 1980s, a decade that began with the election of President Reagan and ended with the launching of Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition. It matured as a political force in the 1970s, serving as the ground troops for the Gingrich Revolution of 1994. And it has been a significant force in 21st century politics, as evidenced by the turnout of so-called values voters in the 2000 presidential election, 2004 presidential election, especially in Ohio. So, is the religious right terminally ill? Or, in the words of Family Research Council's Tony Perkins and Bishop Harry Jackson in their new book, is it experiencing growing pains that precede a healthy expansion? Some maintain the religious right salad days are behind them. In February 2007, Jim Wallace, the founder of Sojourners Magazine and a liberal religious uh, person, and the author of God's Politics, Why the Right Gets It Wrong and the Left Doesn't Get It, declared in Time Magazine essay, we have now entered the post-religious right era. Wallace wrote, though religion has had a negative image in the past few decades, in the years ahead may be shaped by a dynamic and more progressive faith that will make needed social change more possible. And to underlie this note of the religious right is dead, Wallace recently appeared with John Stewart on The Daily Show and said, I've got some good news. The domination of the religious right over our politics is finally finished. In November of last year, Bill Press, a frequent liberal, frequent liberal co-host, <laughs> a frequent liberal co-host of our dearly departed Crossfire program and the author of Trainwreck, The End of the Conservative Revolution and Not a Moment Too Soon, wrote in the conservative internet opinion news magazine, World Net Daily, that no matter who becomes the next president in the United States, the American people have already won a great victory with the total disintegration of the once all-powerful religious right. More recently, EJ, columnist E.J. Vion penned a column called Culture Wars, How, 2000, How 2004, in which he, who uh, has also published a book called Sold Out, Reclaiming Faith and Politics After the Religious Right, stating we are the beginning of a new era in which large secular problems related to war and peace, economics, and the United States standing in the world will displace culture and religion as the electorate's central concerns. Jung added, the era of the religious right is over. To paraphrase Mark Twain's comment upon reading of his famously premature obituary, longtime leaders of the religious right would like you to know that the news of their death, the death of their movement, has been greatly exaggerated. The Family Research Council, a powerful Washington, D.C.-based lobbying group, recently held a press conference to introduce personal faith, public policy, a new book, by the head of the organization, Tony Perkins, and Bishop Harry R. Jackson, an African-American who is heads up an organization called the High Impact Leadership Coalition. 
What our critics see as splintering is actually the growing pains that precede a healthy expansion. The movement is adapting to the changing political environment and broadening its ranks while holding firmly to the principles that have united them thus, united them thus far. Thus, Perkins and Jackson argue that while evangelicals have been drawn mostly to the Republican Party, it will be a good thing for the evangelicals to split their vote, therefore have some kind of an influence within the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. It's an old argument. It's been made uh, by conservative African Americans for many years uh, to no avail. And an old friend of ours, and Paul mentioned Watergate, Charles Colson, who is uh, a major figure now on the religious right, he, along with Ann Morse, penned a recent column for Christianity Today, and the column really much explains it all. No utter collapse. Recent reports of our demise betray the media's ignorance about who we are. And Colson goes on to say, Colson, who now heads up an organization called the Prison Fellowship Ministries, is a faith-based organization that is trying to wrestle money from the Bush administration's faith-based initiative. He goes, he asks, how did we go from being the most powerful voting bloc in America to utter collapse, collapse in four short years? And the answer is simple. It's the media. It's the press up to its old tricks. But here's where Colson takes a point of departure. He talks about striking a recon he, he talks about reconciliation. He talks about how all conservative and liberal evangelicals Everyone, every evangelical leader he knows, from Rick Warren to Jim Dobson to Jim Wallace, right and left, in our own ways, are battling for traditional values. We're defending life, pursuing justice, and caring for the poor. Colson appeals to evangelicals of all stripes to band together. What we have in common is more important than the things that divide us, Colson says. Republicans or Democrats were all committed to the same things. I spoke with a conservative insider who said that uh, last week who said that that kind of kumbaya is not going to fly uh, amongst the uh, religious right leaders. In recent months, I've written several pieces about the movement's future, one titled Religious Right Meltdown, More Fiction Than Fact, and a new one in the media transparency titled For the Religious Right, The Times They Are Changing. Clearly, the religious right is in a transitional period. Old leaders have passed. New leaders have risen. Many of the new leaders head meg mega churches, and besides wanting to fill the seats every weekend, they are also creating community. While they remain strongly anti-abortion and opposed to same-sex marriage, those are not the only arrows in their, in their quiver. Many are concerned about the environment and the impact of global warming on the poor, immigration policy, racial reconciliation, combating poverty and AIDS in Africa, However, each new initiative brings counterclaims. For example, two years ago, a group of megachurch pastors, Christian college presidents, and theologians issued an evangelical climate initiative, which called on the government to enact legislation to limit carbon dioxide emissions and to combat global warming. They were immediately countered by Dobson and Colson and others who signed on to a letter that maintained global warming is not a consensus issue and our love for the creator and respect for his creation does not require us to take a position. Most significantly for the upcoming election, it appears that voters who self-identify as Christian evangelicals are apparently up for grabs, perhaps for the first time since Reagan was elected president in 1980. The Barna Research Group, which is a credible Christian polling firm has found that so-called values voters no longer appear to be marching in complete lockstep with the Republican Party. In fact, a recent survey by Barna found that 40% of all self-identifying born-again adults who plan to vote in November said they would choose a Democrat candidate, Democratic candidate, while just 29% said they would vote Republican. The current investigations of the controversial financial and political activities of prominent so-called prosperity gospel televangelists, the drug and sexcapades of the Bush administration connected Ted Haggard, the continued 
mad musings of televangelist and multimillionaire media mogul Pat Robertson, the inglorious demise of Robertson's Christian coalition, conservative evangelicals' ties to the administration's foreign policy disasters and their refusal to condemn torture, the political intrigues of Dr. Dobson's multi-million dollar empire, the end times visions of Dr. Tim LaHaye, and the miscalculations of the once mighty Ralph Reed and, and Tom DeLay clearly suggest a movement in disarray, a movement in need of a new moral compass. Where the movement has been, what it has meant, and where it is going are all questions that will no doubt continue to drive the publishing industry. However, Despite the chaos, the missteps, missteps, and miscalculations, the movement has been anything but static. It has proved to be adaptable. Although some have argued, and they may be dead on, that the rise and fall of religious rights movements in this country have been cyclical, this has not been your grandfather's religious right. This religious right was built for the long haul. This religious right created citadels of power. This religious right is still extremely well financed and media savvy, still has vast media operations, and continues to build long-lasting institutions, and still, for the most part, can be counted on to act in a relatively coordinated manner. Talk of reconciliation has built-in fault lines. While the old-timers might agree with the young Turks that such issues as global warming, immigration, etc. are important, it does not mean that they will agree on policy solutions to these issues. However, if Perkins, Jackson, Colson are reading the tea leaves correctly and recognize that they too must get on the broader issues bandwagon and hook up with the Hawaiian shirt-wearing Warren, the impeccable outfitted Joel Osteen, the kinder, gentler, and infinitely more cuddly Mike Huckabee, we are all in for some very interesting times. <clears throat> well, uh, I'd like to begin also by uh, expressing my thanks to Dale, to Nolan, and to Julian for inviting me here to Princeton this afternoon, uh, for all of you for agreeing to share this fine spring evening with us, and especially to uh, Bill Berkowitz and Paul Starr for their very perceptive uh, comments, and I hope we can take up some of those in the discussion period, especially, I think, the interesting question about the global crisis of the welfare state in the, in the 70s, because I think that the distinctive ways the United States responded to that crisis really points up some of the arguments that we, um, that we make in this book. Uh, but first, it falls to me this afternoon to consider some of the long-term legacies of the developments that we chart in our book. So how, then, might we assess the lasting influence and the current prospects of the conservative ascendancy that took shape in the 1970s, especially in the volatile, rapidly changing political landscape that we are now inhabiting. Well, just three and a half years ago, on the day after President George W. Bush won re-election, conservative activist Richard Vigory, one of the architects of the new right in the 1970s, confidently predicted the ultimate victory of the conservative movement that he had helped to construct. Now, Vigory said, right after the 2004 election, now comes the revolution. And indeed, Vigory and many of his other fellow movement conservatives insisted that, in his words, conservative Christians and values voters won this election for George W. Bush and for the Republicans in Congress. You don't have to be a diehard activist like Vigory, however, to reach pretty much the same conclusions in 2004. For even if Vigory did exaggerate, Bush won three quarters of the white born-again Christian voters, while ballot measures forbidding gay marriage in 11 different states helped the president win the popular vote majority that had eluded him four years earlier. If you don't implement a conservative agenda now, Vigory wondered aloud, when will you? Just two years later, however, Democrats, in the president's pungent words, put a thumping on Republicans in the 2006 midterm elections. Twelve years after the Gingrich Republican Revolution in Congress had appeared to complete the conservative revolution, Democrats defied most predictions and retook control of both the House and the Senate. 
Americans loudly voiced their opposition to the President's handling of the war in Iraq and Bush's larger foreign policy vision. In so doing, voters expressed discontent with the conservative national security policy that, as the authors in our volume show, took root in the conservative critique of the Cold War in the 1970s. At the same time, recent developments have exposed the limitations of conservatism at home as well as abroad. Across the country, support for embryonic cell, uh, stem cell research energized liberal candidacies and contributed to recent Democratic victories in Wisconsin, Missouri, Maryland, Arizona, Ohio, here in New Jersey. And even with President Bush in the White House and Republicans dominant on Capitol Hill, the federal government, that central bugaboo of the conservative movement, had grown ever larger, costlier, and more powerful over the past seven years. Frustrated by the Bush administration's failure to fulfill the conservative agenda, Richard Vigory himself recently published a scathing attack on the administration and the Republican Party. And its title, I think, said it all, Conservatives Betrayed. So this was just one of many recent books in which conservatives voiced their frustration about the phenomenon of big government conservatism. In many ways, what we call the incomplete revolution of the 1970s defines contemporary American public life. On the one hand, conservatism has entrenched itself with the vigor that even the most committed new right activists would not have imagined when they were plotting it back in the 1970s. Conservative institutions now crisscross the American landscape. The pioneering churches, foundations, think tanks, colleges, businesses, and media outlets that our anthology describes and that you've heard about this afternoon have become familiar and influential players in the national arena. Conservatives have ensconced themselves in the federal judiciary and their policy agenda continues to shape national debate. On foreign policy, stem cell research, restrictions on greenhouse gases, gun control, the conservative movement that coalesced during the 1970s continues to leave its imprint on American society. Meanwhile, the continued expansion of evangelical Christianity testifies to the vitality and the cultural influence of conservative values. Whereas country western music was once populated by pot smoking, beer drinking, anti-establishment figures like Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Johnny Cash, the Nashville country music establishment and most country radio stations united in a boycott in opposition to the Dixie Chicks after the chart-topping trio's lead singer uh, criticized President Bush's foreign policy. Some organizations even sponsored bonfires into which protesters hurled the group CDs. The family values campaigners that first stole the spotlight during the 70s, like James Dobson and the anti-feminist Phyllis Schlafly, have much to be pleased about when they survey early 21st century America. <clears throat> much, but not too much. Abortion remains legal despite decades of concerted effort. Stem cell research has wide public support, and more and more Americans approve of civil rights for homosexuals. Despite resistance to taxation, voters continue to look to the federal government for increases in the minimum wage, protection for their retirement and medical care, and relief from natural disasters, and economic crises. When President Bush made a major push to privatize Social Security, he discovered, much as had Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, that government often turned out to be far more popular than conservatives suggested. It was one thing to talk about the virtues of private accounts and investor choice, but quite another to eliminate the safety net that millions of elderly Americans depended upon. Meanwhile, issues such as the increasingly contentious Iraq war, domestic surveillance, global warming, deficit spending, and immigration split the conservative coalition and left it vulnerable to electoral defeat. The 2006 midterm elections highlighted many of those very fissures and inconsistencies. Turn on a television today or open a web browser and you will find the airwaves full of violent sexuality, edgy humor, and the very secular values conservatives have long derided. Last year, for example, the Los Angeles-based Recording Academy of America conferred its prestigious Grammy Award for the record of the year on the Dixie Chicks, recognizing 
the group's defiant anthem, Not Ready to Make Nice, the industry thumbed its nose at the activists who had boycotted the band. We're in the political equivalent of a world without the law of gravity, one-time Republican strategist and former Christian coalition chief Ralph Reed told, told Time, magazine, I mean, Time magazine last year. We're in the political equivalent of a world without the law of gravity. Nothing we have known in the past seems relevant today. Well, sincere as Reed's confusion, sincere as the frustration of many of today's conservatives might be, the essays in our book demonstrate that the past has much to say about the contemporary condition. The incomplete revolution conservatives directed during the 1970s makes the problems that they face today deep-rooted and difficult to overcome. Frustration remains a defining feature of a movement that has been so sweeping, so powerful politically, yet limited in what it could accomplish and transform. Over the past three decades, conservatives often benefited from larger economic and social forces outside their direction, but they also sometimes succumb to them. The challenges of international relations, the established institutions and policy preferences built into American governance, and the tides of popular culture have often beaten against the conservative movement. That several 2008 Republican presidential contenders were admitted adulterers with multiple marriages, that conservatives divide bitterly over the Iraq war, that GOP standard bearer John McCain passed up the 2007 Conservative Political Action Conference for an appearance on the David Letterman show. All of these reveal deep-seated forces, products of the struggles of the 1970s that constrain even so powerful a force as American conservatives have been since the emergence of the new right. The problems that contemporary conservatives face did not emerge last year. They go back three decades. America turned right in the 1970s, but as Julian indicated, it was not as the result of a political sweep. As the conservative movement took shape and expanded its influence, it faced a series of challenges, a persistent struggle between mounting conservative political power and liberal social change. That struggle defined the rightward turn in the 1970s, and it lingers today. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you all for those interesting remarks. Uh, we now have the floor open for uh, some questions. Yes, right here. Bill, just over the... Over the past uh, month, uh, the subject that you addressed so well has changed a little bit. Do you see any impact at all on what might become known as the religious left as personified by Reverend Jeremiah Wright and uh, people like that? Well, I think uh, there has been some major shifts in the, in the past several months, and I think the Jeremiah Wright situation is a, a situation unto its, has its own uh, integrity to it and is kind of outside what has been going on in terms of how the religious right will either be motivated or have a lack of motivation for the candidacy of John McCain. I think uh, one point that I, I would like to make is that even though McCain did pass up uh, the opportunity to speak to the Conservative Political Action Conference, which was a major, is the major conference every year, he did actively seek out the endorsement of Pastor John Hagee and by doing so has kind of put that story, would that that story, the Hagee story, get as much television time as the Jeremiah Wright story? Yes, uh, in the second row here. <clears throat> One important factor uh, in the rise of conservatism in the 1970s, which has not been remarked upon, uh, was, in, in my opinion, the uh, popular backlash against judicial activism, uh, particularly forced busing to uh, achieve racial integration and uh, reverse discrimination masquerading under the banner of affirmative action. 
Any comment from the panel about that? We do, we do have some uh, uh, work in here about the tensions that emerge between, uh, you know, uh, there's two issues you mentioned. Uh, kind of one is tensions between working class white Americans in urban areas and, and the busing program. Uh, and we have uh, one essay uh, that talks about kind of a, an ethnic revival that took place in, uh, in the 1970s uh, and sometimes ended up uh, touching, touching on, on those uh, issues that you mentioned, uh, including affirmative action, but also how those are sometimes manipulated issues uh, that, you know, we have kind of interesting material on how Nixon took advantage of those tensions, was very conscious about what that could do to the Democratic coalition because it, it pitted two constituencies uh, against each other. Uh, and then the second is what you said about uh, the attacks on judicial activism, which are linked to busing but are much broader. Uh, the, the attacks on judicial activism, I think, become one of the more powerful, uh, at least rallying arguments uh, for the conservative movement. You see it starting as early as Nixon and, and developing into the 70s. Um, there's a new book by a guy named Steve Tellis, which is very interesting, about uh, kind of a very conscientious effort by the conservative movement to make the courts a central place where they could achieve things uh, that were impossible in the executive branch or uh, even in Congress. Uh, and at the same time, they were attacking judicial activism. There was a real push to bring in new justices uh, who were more squarely aligned with uh, conservative ideas. And that really culminates in the 80s then. That movement starts to take shape. Uh, so both are part, part, clearly part of the story of the 70s. Uh, and I think we hear about both of those issues still through today. I just want to uh, say one thing. that The term judicial activism is, of course, an ideological term. Uh, actually, if you uh, look at the rate at which uh, justices are likely to strike down legislation, uh, on this court right now, the most likely to strike down legislation are Justices Scalia and Thomas. The chief activists now are on the right. But you never hear conservatives use the term judicial activism to refer to their own. Similarly, with I mean, it's the same story with executive power, obviously. That's the compliment in that, you know, uh, kind of conservatives have embraced the uh, uh, presidency they once derided. Uh, as, as they obviously gain more control of the White House. So we saw a flip on both of those issues. And it, it, it indicates it's, you know, as much a rhetorical strategy uh, as, as a kind of firm set of beliefs. And certainly opposition to, quote, judicial activism has now been replaced by reverence for original intent, which is, uh, uh, and so that, yeah. that is, and certainly I think uh, Professor Starr is right, so that it's the conservative jurists that have been the most activists and the, the those most willing to overturn precedent as well, a judicial precedent as well as uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, Harold? Do, do I need this uh, microphone? Or? No, I don't. <coughs> I, I'm fascinated by the attempt in the book, which I'm looking forward to reading, uh, to, to get, bring together um, big shocks and big new ideas in the 1970s with a, a kind of political spectrum when you see things in terms of a, a conflict between the two parties in the United States or, or between left and right. Um, but it's, it seems to me, um, and it really comes in a way out of Paul's comments uh, on the international element of this, that some of these big themes don't actually fit all that easily with the right-left spectrum, and in particular, the two that you focused very heavily on, uh, the market um, as a big theme of the new politics in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and uh, religious values. Um, because it's, it's possible to be on the left and think of the market as a source of freedom. And if you think of the story of the 1970s, you might also think of Jimmy Carter and the story of deregulation. Um, if you look at the big, the, the really cataclysmic events in the late 70s that I think swung the world around on a pendulum, um, the uh, Thatcher revolution in Britain, Mrs. Thatcher winning the election, uh, the revolution in Iran against the Shah, uh, Deng Xiaoping's turn to the market, um, uh, the, 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 the Volcker interest rate. I mean, all of these are they're actually hard to categorize in, in many ways, except for the Thatcher one, as, as ideological. Um, and I, I wonder really what you, what you do with this, because it, it speaks, I think, to the 
uh, the, the, the comment that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a left-wing religious position as well. And uh, these things spread over the political spectrum. <coughs> and, and, uh, they're played out in politics, uh, but they don't necessarily work in one particular way. Well, let me, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, one thing about the international context and then one thing about the seeming incongruity of, uh, of moral conservatism and, the, and the, uh, the worship of the market, which in some ways may be seen as contradictory values or positions. So first, um, Professor Starr is indeed right that there was this international crisis of the liberal welfare state across the industrialized world in the 1970s. Um, Mrs. Thatcher in Britain, but also conservative governments in, come to power in Germany, even in Sweden, which had been the epitome of the social democratic welfare state for so long. Of course, in places where the left had, where the, where the right had been in power for a long time, like in France, uh, the socialists come in, but, but quickly adopt a market-centered agenda, um, very much like what the conservative regimes are in the other parts of the world. And yet, and, and the Reagan administration that comes into power in the early 1980s would be the American equivalent thereof. But it's interesting, there are some very fundamental ways in which the American approach to this crisis is different from that of more or less everywhere else in the industrialized world. So only in the United States do we embrace the palliative of supply-side economics. Mrs. Thatcher, for example, is a more traditional fiscal conservative. She actually raises taxes and cuts spending significantly and tries to bring budgets in closer into balance to reduce deficits. So only here do we have the idea that you can actually um, increase spending, reduce taxes, and that, that somehow will, that will produce enough economic growth that you will uh, be able to get away without significant cuts in spending. The second, and I think more telling thing that really speaks to the themes of our books, is that everywhere else, in order to make painful <clears throat> budget cuts, the universal entitlement programs, health care, pensions, the equivalent of our Social Security and Medicare, that's where the cuts are made, whereas the means-tested programs for the very poor are not cut. In many places, they are enhanced. Even in Mitch Mrs. Thatcher's England, in order to justify the cuts in in national health and in pensions. She has to keep the means-tested programs for the very poor, that safety net, in place. Um, not because she's ideologically committed to it, but in part because if you're serious about balancing a budget, it's pensions and health care that are the big ticket items. In the United States, we do the opposite. Means-tested programs for the poor are the only ones that are significantly cut back. Social Security and Medicare are not. In fact, payroll taxes are raised on those so that the Reagan tax cut, um, what it means very little for those people at the bottom of the income ladder because they're paying more in payroll taxes. And I think that, the fact that you can't, that conservative regimes cannot cut Social Security tells you something about the political order in the United States that some of our authors point to. The second thing I just want to talk about briefly because there's a brilliant essay by a historian at Emory University named Joe Crespino in our book, which is about the Christian schools movement and the rise of the right. And uh, one of the uh, really interesting things in that story where the Carter administration considers removing the tax exemption for the lily white Christian academies that had formed in the late 60s and early 70s, some said as an attempt to avoid desegregation, some said as a fighting against the growing immorality in American schools. Uh, but in response to that, we see this uh, impressive organization on the right. In fact, a number of the people that are in that Christian <coughs> schools movement become uh, leading figures in the moral majority. And I think that's really interesting because there's a way that in opposition to ta the tax policies of the government, business conservatives who want to unleash the free market and moral conservatives who might think that it was the unleashed free market that's creating all this pornography and um, sex and violence on television and uh, are, uh, can come together sharing this anti-tax agenda and opposition to a liberal establishment that's not only regulating business too much but is using our tax money to fund what they see as immoral purposes. Um.
Bruce, I think one of the things that distinguishes the United States from the other countries that were experiencing a crisis, the other European, the European countries experiencing a crisis, is the issue of race. Yes. And so that unites the two things you were just talking about. There were cuts in the <coughs> means-tested programs, like welfare. These were programs that, in the public mind, were very much associated with blacks. Uh, and those Christian schools that you mentioned were established in response to desegregation. Uh, you know, that is that is the that has been uh, for the longest time the, the distinguishing element uh, that has affected uh, uh, American politics, and really it stands behind so much of what is going on uh, in the uh, in the 1970s. The, the, I mean, the basic uh, change in the balance of American politics comes from the shift of the South from the Democratic to the Republican Party. That is that is basically what has altered. Uh, the you know the, the, the calculations uh, that we were uh, accustomed to make back in the uh, mid 20th century and uh, and that seems to me to underline what's uh, what, what what's happening if I could just jump in uh, I mean the other part of the book which I think is interesting is you know you have these uh, large-scale changes that are taking place uh, global changes the kind of crisis of the economy or changes of the economy crisis of the welfare state you have big political scandals taking place, like Watergate, obviously, and big shifts, uh, you know, Southerners becoming Republican. But what a lot of the essays in the book do, and they bring the historian's tools, I think, uh, to the issue, is, is then look at kind of how conservatives took advantage uh, politically and were able to capitalize politically on those crises. And uh, uh, Harold's actually right. It, it wasn't inevitable in any way. Uh, there's a lot of counter... Uh, pressure. There's a lot of ways in which an issue like religion could go both ways, even in the 1970s. But what you see again and again in, in the various stories is that uh, as a history, a movement history, conservatives react very effectively, linking these issues to the Republican Party, to this movement that takes hold, and uh, kind of ending with uh, the Ronald Reagan election in 1980. There's an essay by Paul Boyer, a historian on evangelicals, and he makes this point. I mean, he, he says a simplistic equation of evangelicalism with right-wing politics would be misleading, and he points to left-wing religious forces in the 70s, but then goes on to say, you know, it was the Falwells and Dobson still that really dominate the television airways and, and dominate uh, political power. Uh, it's the same, my essay on the Carter years looks at how Carter wins on some issues. He, you know, uh, he wins on the Panama Canal, but current conservatives do pretty well, even when he wins, at taking his victories and turning them against him in the 1978 elections. But, I mean, I, I mean, part of what we're doing is giving some agency to answer the question that you asked, exactly that question, and, and how in various issue areas conservatives were able to kind of make the politics move one way when it wasn't inevitable at all. Let me use the chair's prerogative to uh, interject with a question. So uh, many, many of the panelists have spoken quite uh, descriptively and eloquently about the, uh, the fractures and fissures and <coughs> inconsistencies and contradictions of the uh, conservative movement in 2008. I guess my question is, suppose that uh, Bruce and Julian had edited the following book, Leftward Bound, Making America Liberal in the 1930s and What It Means in 1978. Um, how would your description of, of liberalism in, 19, in the late 1970s be different or similar to the description of the conservatives uh, in 2008? Well, I, well, you, I can't we, speak for both of us, so why don't we split it up? I'll split it sure, up. Well, you, you go ahead. But are we in 1978? Is that what we're splitting Well, I mean, that, that's, we one, of, that's one of the that. premises of the okay. question, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I don't think it would be, I, for me, it wouldn't be altogether different. I don't think movements are uh, united, and they're usually not coherent. That's not something uh, that is normal in a political movement. Uh, all these kind of divisions could be, f not, different kinds of divisions could be found uh, with liberalism. Liberals found in the 1930s, they too could not just remake America. Uh, some of the most successful programs of the New Deal were successful because they worked around some of the biases of uh, kind of anti-government pressure in America. So Social Security has an earmarked tax, which is very consciously put in the, in the program uh, to try to uh, 
forge a commitment by workers over generations, even though there's a resistance to government. There's divisions over racial issues that exist through the 1960s. And, and a similar story of uh, kind of how liberal activists, liberal political leaders were able to move beyond those divisions and, and forge a successful uh, political coalition for several decades, I think is, is a true part of, of the story, as well as the limited victories that liberals faced uh, through the period that we study. So for me, it, it's, this is a, a different movement. It goes a different way. Uh, but I think, I, I think we should study liberalism that way. I think it's a mistake to <clears throat> present it as so different than this and so coherent uh, and, 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 so, uh, and so victorious. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question, and, and I'd never thought of it that way. But in in so many ways, the stories are in are um, in parallel. I mean, liberals from the 1930s through the 1960s into the 1970s um, really go through the same process of institution building and idea development that we see on the right beginning in the 1970s, and they are able to ensconce themselves because of that even when the, the short-term electoral tides or economic and social conditions um, kind of blow against them. So it's a similar story. Another part of the story is that in both cases, the white south is the key region, uh, key regional center in different ways and a very different white south. Uh, more than two-thirds of the voters in the, in the uh, uh, more than two-thirds of white voters in the south today were not there in 1970. I mean, part of that is just generational succession, but a large number, part of that is migration from other parts of the country. It's a different white South. It acts in a different way, but it's still the bastion of the conservative opposition to liberalism. And also, I mean, I think the other parallel is that even if we think of the last few decades as a conservative ascendance, we, we have to understand that that was incomplete. The same thing could be said of the liberal consensus of the 30s through the 60s. In fact, if you just ponder this question, since 1945, since the end of World War II, there have been 15 presidential elections. And how many of those 15 has the Democratic Party nominee won a majority of the electoral vote? The answer? Two. Lyndon Johnson's landslide in 1964, Jimmy Carter very narrowly in 1976. Harry Truman never did it, John Kennedy. Bill Clinton, even Al Gore, who had the most popular votes in 2000, <laughs> didn't win 50% of the popular vote. So, I mean, I think that shows you, I mean, that, that Democratic candidates always, over the, even during the period of the liberal ascendancy, face some very significant opposition. Perfect. Uh, yes? The, um, the economic developments that led to the ascendancy the economic developments that led to the ascendancy of the conservative movement in the 1970s, how have those developments impacted on traditional conservative support for free trade? Um, and is free trade a factor in, um, in free trade uh, for conservatives? Okay. Okay. Paul, you want to talk about <laughs> uh, Well, I don't think, uh, I, you know, there, there, there have always been uh, so, uh, sources of opposition to free trade among conservatives, I mean, it depends. This is this, this is not strictly uh, a conservative uh, liberal uh, issue. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of what's happened over the last several decades is uh, a process that's uh, called issue evolution. That issue, <coughs> issues and parties have become aligned in particular ways that they weren't necessarily historically. And let's just take the case of abortion. As of uh, nineteen. Uh, 72. I believe uh, at the Republican convention, I believe a majority of the delegates were in favor of abortion rights. Abortion only became uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a clear position for Republicans over a period of time. Uh, and the same thing on trade. I think I, I don't think there were uh, clear. Uh, I, I don't have the public opinion evidence on this, but I don't think this was as clear a liberal conservative issue at the beginning of this period. But over time, it has evolved, and I think it has to do with the way parties sort out these issues and, and become uh, more attached to one position or another. And over, I mean, for a long time, trade <coughs> was a, an issue that divided both parties rather than united them. So, for instance, the Democratic Party had, especially in its labor wing, 
um, some strong protectionist elements. But the Democratic Party had been the party of free trade. I mean, free trade goes back to Cordell Hull, who was Secretary of State under FDR and tried to, and, and the Democratic Party had been the party of low tariffs and trade liberalization going back to its mm -hmm. creation in, in, in the time of Jefferson and Jackson. And so the Democratic Party was divided. The Republican Party has not only been divided, it remains divided. The, uh, the, uh, the Patrick Buchanan uh, sort of Fortress America wing of the Republican Party uh, that wants to seal the borders against immigration is also a protectionist in its, in its trade outlook and has been critical of, uh, as critical of NAFTA as have some of the, uh, the labor people who are in the camp of the Democratic candidates today. Yes. Um, just because the, the panel has some, some expertise, I guess, on the media, and I hadn't heard something about that necessarily, I wanted to, to ask a question on it. Um, this idea of, uh, you know, the, the liberal media, uh, quote unquote, um, is, I, I guess I have two questions. Um, is that kind of a sentiment that has existed, you know, since the, the, the 1970s and was really just tapped into in, in the 1990s? And, and, and secondly, um, is this a sentiment that still is very powerful or after Fox News, after kind of CNN and, and other networks kind of transforming the way they do news, I think based on the Fox News format, do you think people have, have, have you know, come to see the, the liberal media idea as being kind of hollow um, or does it, does it still carry a lot of weight? Well, it depend, depends obviously who you ask. Uh, uh, just in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the, both the facts and the history, uh, it, it is true that if you do surveys of reporters, of journalists, you will find that there are considerably more Democrats than Republicans among them. On the other hand, if you do those same surveys among the executives of the big media corporations, you'll find the opposite, that there are more Republicans than Democrats. So that within these organizations, there's more authority uh, upstairs uh, in, the, uh, 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 in conservative hands, and more of the reporters uh, tend to be, uh, tend to be uh, liberal. Uh, now, you know, when, when, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, we had a uh, system where, in broadcasting, there were, there were just three networks, and there were tremendous constraints on the expression of political views. And they tended to uh, uh, try to uh, uh, keep to the center and to avoid any identification uh, with a political <coughs> position. Over the decades, we've had the expansion of cable, the multiplication of channels, the development of niche audiences. And along with that came the development of conservative niche audiences and now liberal. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the different cable channels, they obviously are, are developing a different uh, political complexion. This had partly to do with changes in regulation the abandonment of the Fairness Doctrine, which had required uh, broadcast stations uh, to represent uh, more than one side. Now they are free. Talk radio stations are free to be exclusively uh, conservative. That, that wasn't possible under an earlier regulatory regime. So you've had the evolution of regulation. You've had the, the changing uh, nature of technology and the availability of alternatives. All of these have played into a more polarized uh, structure of the media to go along with our more polarized uh, politics. But it, it and, and the attacks on it, though, are not from the 1990s. Uh, it, I mean, if you study Richard Nixon, uh, it's very conscientious uh, effort by the Nixon administration to either get around the liberal media, to intimidate the liberal media, or uh, for some such as Patrick Buchanan, who worked for Nixon, uh, one of the pushes was to create alternative media or find new ways to get ideas out. And so part of the stories of the 70s is the beginning of what ends up with Fox News. Uh, it's the creation of think tanks that will counter the Brookings institutions of Washington. Uh, it's the use of talk radio, uh, which starts as an alternative. The whole point is it's an alternative media in the late 70s. In the early 80s, C-SPAN would become a mechanism as well. Newt Gingrich instantly realizes and, and part, that this is a way to communicate to people without the networks uh, because you could make speeches in the morning and, and they see you. And, and part of the idea was that liberal reporters, in their mind, 
uh, controlled what went out on those three networks or what went out in the newspapers. Uh, and, and so kind of a media-oriented strategy is very much part of 1970s conservatism. I think uh, this is when it really starts not just to be known that this was a concern, but they start to respond and build alternative ways to get their message out. Okay, let me just add uh, that Richard Vigory, um, who is the king, the grand guru of direct mail, he argued a long time ago that, that conservatives created their own media, and one of the best applications of that was that almost every day you could go to your mailbox and find some sort of direct mail piece from any number of the dozens and dozens of organizations that were being founded in the 70s and 80s. And that itself spiraled to the next level of media, which was the talk radio. Although talk radio, Christians on talk radio have been with uh, America forever. And Vigory explicitly said that direct mail was a strategy of political communication because he believed that the other media were controlled by liberals. And so you had to find some way around it. Probably the most famous or maybe it's the most ridiculous, but that's why it's the most famous example of the Nixon administration's attempt to discredit the liberal media was when Nixon sent his then Vice President Spiro Agnew out on a tour to attack, the, to attack us, uh, university professors, uh, the effete core of impudent snobs who masquerade as intellectuals, uh, but also uh, to attack what he called the nattering nabobs of negativism uh, in what? the media. The, the interesting thing, the little irony, is that from the 30s through the 1950s, there was no idea about the liberal media in popular discourse, but there was a debate about the conservative media. Certainly Franklin Roosevelt felt, not without reason, that most newspaper editors in the country were against him. <coughs> One of the reasons that he decided to hold twice-weekly press conferences and to do his famous fireside chats was to have the same kind of unmediated uh, appeal to, to voters and audiences because he thought that he wasn't going to get fair treatment from most editors of newspapers at that time. Terrific. We only have a, few, a couple more minutes, so we have time for one more question. Yes, in the back. I'm, I'm wondering, Professor Shulman, you mentioned um, Richard Vigory's book, Betrayed, and it seems like there's a movement among a lot of conservatives and people on the right towards trying to explain why the Bush administration has sort of betrayed or failed the ideas of American conservatism, when it seems to me like you can trace a lot of the results, for instance, of failures in Iraq to American militarism started during the Reagan years, and for instance, the failure to respond to Hurricane Katrina to the result of an ideology that argues that the federal government shouldn't really have a role in helping people. So I'm wondering, if you, you, per, you if the panel perceives the Bush administration as a betrayal of the principles of the new right, or rather as the, the principles of the new right simply come to fruition in a government that with representatives of that movement for the first time without uh, op, so much opposition to check them. I mean, it depends who you're going to ask on the panel. I, I actually think you're right in that second formulation that some of the problems conservatives are wrestling with are conservatives that come out of the policies uh, that have been promoted, whether military policies or whether uh, kind of uh, efforts to weaken uh, civil, civil service or certain government agencies. And, um, and, and to say betrayed kind of uh, implies that the problems don't come from conservatism. They, they come from someone who uh, kind of uh, did something wrong with it. But I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, that's why it's, it's going to be a lot harder to, to fix things than simple, for conservatives, for genuine conservatives, than just electing a new president. I mean, they're, they're wrestling with themselves, not just with the president who's gone in the wrong direction. I think one of the things that conservatives consistently feel is a sense of dissatisfaction. Dissatisfied with the situation no matter what it is on the ground or is in reality. David Quo who was uh, uh, highly placed uh, in the uh, Bush administration's faith-based initiative. He wrote a scathing book about the faith-based initiative and Bush's betrayal of it, despite the fact that more than $7 billion have been given to faith-based and community-based organizations. So I think there is this profound dissatisfaction, and what it leads to, ironically, is a stronger movement. If you can talk about how you were betrayed, 
If you can talk about how you're disappointed, if you can talk about the enemy still out there, the liberal media, and any other number of uh, rhetorical phrases that you can come up with, you can build, you can continue to build your movement. It's not really surprising, I think, with uh, President Bush's popularity ratings down in the 30s, uh, that, uh, that conservatives would uh, want to disassociate themselves and want to uh, say that, indeed, they were not responsible for policies that have proved uh, unsuccessful and unpopular. Uh, but, uh, but I think there is a direct relationship. And if you just run your mind back a few years earlier, there were many conservatives who were uh, – enormously enthusiastic about the, just the things that the Bush administration was doing that got it into trouble, like the war in Iraq. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks the panel, thank you. and thanks uh, you all for coming.